Hello, this is Richard Silverstein of Tikkun Olam. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the deadly terror attack in Boston last week. Monday was the one week anniversary of that bombing in which three bystanders were killed and 170 wounded. In later attacks that week, a police officer was killed and another seriously injured by the suspected terrorists who struck at one of the nation's most important public athletic events. Two brothers, Jokar and Tamerlan Tsarnaev, aged 19 and 26 respectively, are suspected of a series of attacks last week that left one of them dead and the other severely wounded from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Today, the surviving brother, Jokar, was charged with using a weapon of mass destruction by authorities. He's being questioned in his hospital bed. There's a controversy raging because the federal government has directed that he not be read his, quote, his Miranda rights, which guarantee him the right to a lawyer and to remain silent. This is a right that is a major one afforded to criminal defendants by a Supreme Court ruling in the 1960s. Abrogating that right is advocated by hawkish Republicans who see the war on terror as continuing to boost their election prospects. During the shootout with police on Thursday, which happened in a Boston suburb, the suspects hijacked a car and threw bombs into the street to deter pursuing police. They used grenades and assault weapons and fired 200 bullets in the ensuing melee. When Tamerlan ran out of ammunition, he left the car and charged police, wearing a suicide vest. A brave policeman tackled him to the ground. Jokar then floored the engine and pointed the car at the police. They scrambled. They just barely made it out of the way. But he ran over the body of his brother and killed him. He was captured the next day, hiding in a covered boat in a backyard in suburban Boston. During the search, the entire city was on lockdown. Hundreds of police combed entire neighborhoods going door to door trying to find him. The boys' motives are unclear. We know that Tamerlan's brand of Islamic observance had become increasingly strict and intolerant in the past year. He had yelled at the Imam of a Cambridge mosque during a sermon which compared Martin Luther King favorably to the prophet. Tsarnaev said it was impermissible to accord a non-Muslim such an honor. Members of the mosque ejected him from the service and warned him that he would no longer be welcomed if he continued such behavior. He posted extremist uh, Islamic, Islamist videos on his YouTube account and participated in Russian Chechen web forums in which he praised jihad. But there's no smoking gun, no expressions of homicidal rage that would indicate an intent to commit such horrible crimes. The Los Angeles Times reported the FBI received a report on Tamerlan Tsarnaev's radical views from the Russian intelligence service, the FSB, before his 2012 trip to that country's restive Muslim republics of Dagestan and Chechnya. Yet after examining his background and interviewing him face to face, the U.S. security agency gave him a clean bill of health. U.S. authorities acknowledged that Russia contacted the FBI to say the 26-year-old ethnic Chechen had drastically changed since 2010 and was preparing to leave the U.S. to join unspecified underground groups, according to an official FBI statement. In hindsight, it's clear the FBI botched an opportunity to probe more deeply into Tsarnaev's beliefs and activities to, to, to determine whether he posed a domestic threat. Had they done so, they might have disrupted the carnage that Boston suffered this week. In all the hoopla, in the aftermath of this crisis, the flag-waving and back-slapping and Muslim-bashing, I've heard nary a word about the security lapse that allowed this tragedy. While it's natural to take the simpler, less troublesome approach in situations like this, we do so at our own risk. It's critical to learn lessons from this failure and how to avoid it in future. There are understandably Muslims and progressives who are leery of labeling this as a terrorist act. Doing so fall, falls into every available Islamophobic trap known to man. Figures like Pam Geller are having a field day since it confirms their fondest dreams and prejudices. 
Representative Peter King adds more fuel to the fire, saying, quote, We're at war with Islamic terrorists. It's coming from people within that community by the terrorists coming from that community, just like the mafia comes from Italian communities, unquote. Further, National Public Radio falsely reports there have been no acts of terror in the U.S. since 9-11 when there have been many. The problem is that the U.S. media only tends to label an act as terrorist when it's committed by a Muslim. When white supremacists or anti-abortionists murder victims, it's not seen as terrorism. It's certainly reasonable to halt to heed the cautionary warnings from Palestinian blogger Ali Abu Nima asking us only to report what we know and not to fuel the worst prejudices of Americans and their ill-informed media mandarins with idle speculation. But to me it makes little sense to claim that nothing we know now about the Tsarnaevs and their motivations fit, fits legal definitions of terrorism, therefore we should not jump the gun. My philosophy is different. While it's important to report accurately, especially when tempers are high and there's so much at stake, if we fail to report what seems obvious and right in front of our faces, we run the risk of failing our readers and our political cause. We may wish, as David Sirota wrote in his blog, that the Marathon bom bombers had been white guys, but they weren't. We may have hoped not to fan the flames of prejudice against Muslims here and worldwide, but our worst fears were realized. I don't see how we do our cause any service but denying, by denying what seems either inevitable or at least highly likely. I would far prefer to, while being cautious and responsible in my reporting, accept what appears likely that this was an act of terror, no matter how misguided, and draw the proper lessons from it. I would farther, far rather explain why it happened and what we might learn about our own behaviors that might lessen the chance of it happening again. For example, I'd like Americans to ponder this loving image of the younger Tamerlan and Jokar with their younger sister, which is the exemplar of innocence and devotion. Let's try to contemplate how two such loving boys could turn into such monsters. What happened to them? Where did such, ange such angels go and why? That seems a worthy enterprise, one that will do some good, lessen the hate, and make the world, if not a much better place, then at least a little less bad than it otherwise might be. This is Richard Silverstein of Tikkun Olam. Thanks for watching.